Welcome to Think Tech on Spectrum OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Cynthia Sinclair. And I'm Keisha King. In our show this time, we'll attend the Tech Force Hawaii Conference and Expo at the Hawaii Convention Center. It featured three important afternoon business panels covering media, communications, and co-opetition in Hawaii. Jay Andrews of Oceanit made a short promotional video for the conference in our Think Tech studio. If you are an employer, a job seeker, or a student, join us for Tech Force Hawaii Conference and Expo September 26th at the Hawaii Convention Center. Tech Force Hawaii is a first-of-its-kind conference that puts the spotlight on technology-based workforce development solutions and successes. Join us for thought leader discussions in our speaker hall, starting with a keynote by Jamie Cassup, Chief Education Evangelist with Google. In our exhibitors hall, interact with nearly 40 exhibitors, experiment with cutting edge technology, and engage in design thinking activities. The conference covered many things about technology that is changing the way we work, learn, and live, and about facing our challenges as a state squarely in the face. Can we lead with agility and adopt tech changes and disruptions? Are we giving our students sufficient survival skills and the mindset to meet the challenges of our time? When will we stop being ashamed to tell our tech success stories? Can we think big enough and act boldly enough to finally stop the brain drain? If this conference was about one thing, it was about statewide collaboration by motivating people to develop STEM and cyber skills. These issues shape the multidisciplinary panels in the program. Bart Lum of Bite Marks was the master of ceremonies. Governor David Ige made opening remarks. Jan Boyven of HPU introduced the morning keynote, which was presented by Jamie Cassip, Chief Education Evangelist at Google. This was followed by a morning competencies panel featuring Brooke Connor of DOE, Scott Godwin of the GM National Security Directorate, John Gotanda of HPU, Christina Kishimoto of DOE, and Stephen Schatz of Hawaii P20, moderated by Steve Auerbach of PCAT. In the afternoon media partner presentation, we heard from Rick Blangiardi of Hawaii News Now, Ian Kitajima of Oceanit, and Ian Shuring of Hawaii News Now, moderated by Bert Lum. So I was inspired by those videos. I'm also inspired by the fact there's a conference like this and you're in the audience today and it's an honor for me and any chance I get to represent the men and women of Hawaii News Now. We were all fighting for life support. The stations themselves weren't heavily funded. This has always been a tough advertising market. Really, quite honestly, the way the business has evolved through the islands nearly, nearly never really left anybody with a lot of money. So the point being, when we saw this opportunity to consolidate, <clears throat> what we saw in it was a chance to provide and build for Hawaii, a 21st century multimedia company. Despite the economic woes, if you know, I mean, you know, this thing here became a game changer. Jobs introduced this in 2007, I think it was June 2007. So at that point, we began to see some of the traction in mobile technology. None of us could have predicted in 2008, 2009, um, what was going to happen for us as a people. None of us saw that coming. But we did think that, you know what, this distribution is very different. This is, you know, this is going to create different expectations. Hence our name, Hawaii News Now. So that being the case, we really made the decision that we were going to do that. So the, the genius of, of the name was, well, we knew we had to call ourselves Hawaii. We knew that if we were going to aggregate an audience, it would have to be through news. The little three-letter word now was the brilliance of the and in that equation. Because what that did was it dictated to us, if we're going to live up to that brand, is we'd have to learn how to digitize who we were. It used to be only yesterday, for all of you, I'll make that statement. If you heard about something, you had to do something somewhat proactive to find out more about it. Today, the expectation is very different. If it's something newsworthy, and it could be national, international, certainly local, the expectation, it comes to me. And that's our ability to meet that expectation. That's a very different delivery system. And it's a very much now kind of a thing, and especially the world that we live in. So that really required a whole lot of different thinking, a whole lot of different kind of people, and really, quite honestly, a lot of, a lot of strain and growth in that part. Let me just tell you one, one really kind of nice story. I could tell you a whole lot of other stories. We mentioned the Hokulea up there. We were involved with the Hokulea before its sale, and we were involved with the Hokulea throughout its sale. So much so that we were excited about its homecoming, and we decided, you know what? It's unscripted TV. 
but we want to do a really good job out of reverence, out of respect for what that voyage was about. And so we decided to throw everything we had at it, 11 cameras and two drones in the air. I kind of wired K.I. Tucker. I said, you fall in the water, you die, brother. So don't fall in the water. But we want these pictures on the canoe coming in, and this is the only way we can get them. I mean, we really went all out. And for six and a half hours, we did live TV, and we did a really good job. We had a great team on the beach, as well as you know, out in the water, and we covered it in every way we possibly could. And you know, it was a Saturday, and I think a lot of people in Hawaii got to watch it, and they liked it. It was certainly, the beach was packed. But the thing that was really great about that was we put that on Facebook Live, and over two million people watched that. And we really got to share Hawaii with the world. When I started in this business in 1977, if we were over in Kailua and we were taping any one of you in an interview, the reporter would literally have to shoot that, get in a car, drive over, hopefully get through to Pali, get to Kapilani Boulevard on time, do the edit and try to get it on TV, maybe then. We couldn't even get a signal over the mountain range, okay? Today, we go global. Normally, what, what happens is that, you know, we go on and they will drill us with a bunch of questions. What do you think about the new iPhone? <laughs> well, you know, it's super pricey, but it's got great camera. If you get the Pro, it's like three cameras, you got wide angle. And this know. goes on for three and a half or four yeah. minutes. <laughs> but now we get to reverse the, the, the roles and we get to ask Ian, not this Ian, this gotcha. Ian, some questions <laughs> about some of the technology that's now available on the newscast. Mm -hmm. Ian, you want to start? Maybe that could be part of the question. Well, I think one of it is, you guys are doing so many amazing things. Maybe you can share <clears throat> some, some of the things you guys are doing right now. The backpacks that you mentioned already, if we were to narrow down the biggest technological advancement that we have at our disposal, it's that. Uh, these, they really are backpacks. You wear them, they're connected to a camera, and inside that unit, you know, about this big or so, are cell phone modems that connect to every major cell phone carrier. So if you're in a place with you know, great AT&T service but poor Sprint service, it's gonna transmit your video back to the station using whatever uh, receiver you're getting the best signal with. I think the one thing that has really helped us the most, especially when you talk about immediacy and relevancy, you know, this morning there are uh, these people getting arrested at Waimanalo Bay Beach Park because they're opposed to this development and we're streaming the whole thing. And at this point, you know, it's not even just a Facebook Live on your phone. It's a complete news operation that is being brought in through a backpack. So that's really exciting for us. The need to cater to, uh, you know, what Rick was talking about, the expectation that news is going to come to you, uh, that even that expectation, I think, is evolving where, you know, a year ago it was that news is going to find me somehow. And the expectation now is I'm using this platform and I'm expecting this news to reach me on this specific platform. And so trying to deduce what those platforms are and where the viewers are and where they're expecting that news to reach them is the next most exciting challenge that I think we're, we're looking at. That sort of guides our day-to-day -day strategy, you know, is taking what's happening now in Waimanalo or wherever it can be and not just delivering it on the news, which is what we're known for, but delivering it to people where they are in the medium that they're choosing to consume it. There are a lot of kind of cool sort of uh, visual gadgets that are being implemented, like mm -hmm. the Weather Channel. Sure. And uh, I'm just dying to see Guy Hagi in a, you know, a, a six-foot tsunami surge. Yeah. And so when is, <laughs> is, that, is that just too much eye candy, or, and is the technology too expensive, or, or when do you see no. perhaps Hawaii News Now incorporating that? I think there's a very real potential for, for augmented reality in news. Uh, as we tell stories every day, the question we ask is how can we most effectively help our viewers understand what's happening right now? And if augmented reality is presented in such a way that the viewer knows that it's augmented, which is not so much of a challenge now, but as that technology progresses, we, we will get to a point where you're going to have to differentiate, right? When mm -hmm. as augmented reality becomes so good and so precise, 
you'll have to find ways to, to make sure your viewer knows what they're looking at. But with that not being such a big problem for now, if you know that six foot tsunami wave in studio is the best way to help the viewers at home understand that story, then I think that's something we should all look for. Um, it would have been, now I know there were no deaths or injuries last year during the volcanic eruption, but if there had been an AR way to, the, the question that I kept asking myself, the majority of the people who were interested in that lava eruption story last year aren't especially familiar with the geographic layout of Hawaii Island in general and in, of Lower Puna specifically. Uh, and so how could we, you know, you hear about how many homes have been destroyed and how many acres of land have been covered, but how can we translate that to people in ways that they understand? Uh, and the two that I tried to explore without you know, the, the, the very short answer to your question is we don't yet have the graphical capabilities to pull off augmented reality in a, in a, a meaningful way yet, but the two numbers or the two maps that it would have been useful for, if you lifted up the lava field from Hawaii Island last year and transported it, you know, just laid it flat on the island of Oahu, mm. That lava field goes from Manoa to Diamond Head to the edge of Kaka'ako. The communication panel went on to feature Isla Young of Stemworks, Ian Kitajima of Oceanit, and Tyler Iokepa Gomes of Elemental Accelerator, moderated by Christine Sakuda of Transform Hawaii Government. All of our 10 campuses is all about properly preparing the graduates and giving them the, the pathways to get from their through their from and through their undergraduate degrees, be it two year, be it four year, be it continuing education, and really developing those skills for the workforce of today. So the communications piece is absolutely critical to make that happen. We've got a lot of great success stories, but really one of the things that this is all about Hawaii. One of the things that we don't do very well is we don't tell the story. We don't talk about the stuff that we do. We don't talk about our successes. And that's the other part of communications that I think our panel is going to be really great and enlighten us about this morning. I think one of the first questions to ask the panel is, you know, we have talked a lot and heard a lot today about technology and innovation. What does technology mean since it changes so quickly and so rapidly? And what does innovation mean? And so our STEMworks program is actually quite layered. We've got a lot of pieces, um, a heavy focus on our teachers and making sure our teachers throughout the state are inspired and have the tools that they need 
uh, to really educate and um, make sure that their students have the opportunities that they need. Uh, we do all kinds of software camps and gen cyber camps in partnership with UH and PCAT. Um, we provide the Hawaii STEM conference, which was mentioned, um, which is a really engaging way to bring together our educational system, teachers, students, and industry here. And we're really trying to connect the dots between what they're learning, what they should be learning, and then how that equates to an actual job. So innovation is, and, and the technologies are always changing. So we're no longer growing our young people for a specific job. We're looking at what skills do they need Need. and the um, soft skills was mentioned this morning we call it power skills how are we um, helping them to have the hard skills but then also the skills that they need to be very productive meaningful and then find jobs that they absolutely love one of my mentors one day uh, just really quick I was I was presenting in front of like a group of students at the, at the office in our Duke design lab and she was there for some reason. I can't remember why she was there. This is actually uh, Punani Burgess. She was sitting there, I think waiting for me for something, and she was listening to me explain what we do at OceanNet. And I would, I guess what I was, I was sharing were all these various innovations or technologies, but I, I think the way I was doing it was ex to explain first, what is the problem we're trying to solve? What is the human problem we're trying to solve? And then I would talk about the technology. And then as I was doing this, in the middle of all of this, she, would, she just burst it out and just said, stop. <laughs> you know, she said, stop. And I was like, what? And she said, ah, oh, I, I understand what you guys do or what you're trying to do, which is when most people talk about innovation or technology, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about some widget or an iPhone or some technology. And she, but she said, when, you're talk, when you talk about innovation, you're talking about people. You're talking about people. And that's actually where innovation comes from. It actually comes from people and the way they think and the cultures that get created. And through that process, the outcome is some gadget widget, some cool thing that, that helps people's lives. Ian just set it up really nicely for me. We don't really define technology as being a single thing. Um, and innovation either, we think of it about people and we're thinking about solutions and climate is one of the greatest threats that we're all collectively facing right now. And so when we're thinking about what innovation and technology look like together for us, it's about what are the solutions that are most creative and how can we help them move the fastest to solve these problems for us. Um, and so as an accelerator, we're dual missioned in that uh, obviously we want our companies to succeed, but we also want to offer transformative change to a place. And so in doing that, we've actually really spread out what we do to create the most impact and the most change. So we work with Isla in the educational sector and we're trying to figure out ways to create better opportunities for interns. Uh, we launched something called Root and STEM, which is the first interactive STEM map for the state of Hawaii that includes every single STEM opportunity, K through, uh, K through 12 and then post-grad. Uh, we work with the business community and we really try to think about how we can help impact the bottom lines because at the end of the day, there are still entities who see uh, cost as a barrier to adoption and integration, and that's what we want. The whole point of an internship is to <laughs> yeah, experience, spoiler. and so sometimes they absolutely love it and they're like, oh good, I'm on the right track, and then sometimes they're like, okay, wait, hold on, I gotta pivot here, this is yeah. not for me, which yeah. is a beautiful thing to learn at a young age. How to do that. Yeah. yeah. But I'm gonna say even the most basic things too, you know, one thing that we're, you know, we notice sometimes, and again, as adults we do this too, you know, is there's, there's, Someone speaking, or there's, you know, even like our CEO speaking, and you know, and the interns are looking at their phones the whole time. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. these, these, and these things they don't realize that a lot of people are actually watching them too. They think, oh, because I'm an intern, no one's watching. Saying, like, no, absolutely, you're gonna get talked to about this after. <laughs> you know, it's like these things, right? That they, I don't know if they, they're not aware that you know, there's a, there's a certain level of you know respect that you should give someone when there's. When they're, you know, the attention should be there, not someplace else. So this is part of, you know, because of the social media piece of it, whatever, this is part of, sometimes they, they may not be fully aware. So part of it is to coach them through that. And, and then the guys and the team are really good. The mentors are part of that as well. And then we're, we're at fault too, right? We're like the leadership team and, you know, the boss is talking and I'm looking at my phone, you know. <laughs> Right? It's like, you know, they pick it up from somewhere, right? <laughs> They're picking it up from us, too. So I, I, I shouldn't say it's just them. Well, that, that, that's the best of both worlds, I guess, because 
you mentioned, you know, when going back to this idea of why don't we brag and why don't we, we share more? And your comment, Ian, was that, well, innovation is just sort of a normal part of what we do that we don't think it's innovation. And I think maybe that we cut ourselves short because, I mean, I, I think in Hawaii we collaborate quite a bit. And because we collaborate and we're so community focused, there's this sort of natural innovation that we sort of take for granted. So I, I don't know, I just wanted to know if, yeah, if you absolutely. find that as well and, yeah. you know, how do we, you know, recognize that and communicate more and brag more about that. But, but that's why, too, we, we, should, we need to get out of Hawaii, too. Yeah. Like, we, you need to have your students or yourself, you need to go out. You need to, you know, work, you know, have customers in other parts of the world and go there and go, wow, you know, we're actually pretty good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, wow, we really kick butt, you know? We, you know, there's, I think part of it is if you only stay here, you only, we only know what we know. And then when you go out, you go, wow. You know, because I used to work on the other side of the world and I worked with, like, these are the best of the best in mobile technologies. And I thought to myself, you know, I actually have lots of friends in Hawaii that are just as good as these guys and gals. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know, you don't know that until you go there, until you get out, I yeah. think. And th that was the part that was, was a big kind of moment for me was, okay, it's time to come home. Mm -hmm. Because of that, it was like, I always was, well, if I'm really good, then I, I, I should be somewhere else. Like, if you're really good, you wouldn't be here. And that's just, you know. Yes. Finally, the co-opetition panel featured Brennan Morioka of the College of Engineering at UH Manoa, Peter Dames of Servco, Mike McCartney of DBED, and Alan Oshima of Hawaiian Electric, moderated by Anna Alenta Sneed. There was also an expo at the conference with some 50 exhibitors, including Oceanit's quote, petting zoo and strategy mapping activities that ran every hour in what they called the design thinking playground. The presenting sponsor of the conference was HIPAA, the Hawaii Institute for Public Affairs, along with a number of what they call disruptor sponsors. If you want to know more about the Hawaii Institute for Public Affairs, see HIPAAonline.com. And now let's check out our ThinkTech schedule of events going forward. ThinkTech broadcasts its talk shows live on the internet from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. most weekdays. Then we broadcast our earlier shows all night long and on the weekends. If you missed a show or if you want to replay or share our shows, they're all archived on demand on thinktechhawaii.com and YouTube. And we post all our shows as podcasts on iTunes. 
Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and live stream and YouTube links, or sign up on our email list and get our daily email advisories. ThinkTech has a high-tech green screen studio at Pioneer Plaza. If you want to see it or be part of our live audience, or if you want to participate in our shows, contact shows at thinktechhawaii.com. Go ahead, give us a thumbs up on YouTube or send us a tweet at thinktechhi. We'd like to know how you feel about the issues and events that affect our lives in these islands and in this country. We want to stay in touch with you and we'd like you to stay in touch with us. Let's think together. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of ThinkTech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Thanks to our ThinkTech underwriters and grantors. The Atherton Family Foundation. Carol Munley and the Friends of ThinkTech. The Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education. Collateral Analytics. The Cook Foundation. Dwayne Carisu. The Hawaii Community Foundation the Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners, Hawaii Energy, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, Hawaiian Electric Company, Integrated Security Technologies, Galen Ho of BAE Systems, Kamehameha Schools, MW Group, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sydney Stern Memorial Trust, Volo Foundation, Yuriko J. Sugimura. Thanks so much to you all. Okay, Keisha, that wraps up this week's edition of Think Tech. Remember, you can watch Think Tech on Spectrum OC16 several times every week. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more Think Tech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on Think Tech, visit thinktechhawaii.com. Be a guest or a host, a producer or an intern, and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks so much for being part of our Think Tech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification, and global awareness. And of course, the ongoing search for innovation wherever we can find it. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important Think Tech episode. I'm Cynthia Sinclair. And I'm Keisha King. Aloha, everyone. <laughs>